right, so tell me, let me introduce you the next speaker, John Junk. He is an interdisciplinary scholar, I would say. He is the director of interdisciplinary science at the University of Delaware. He uh, teaches biology, but also has appointments in mathematics and bioinformatics. He does a lot of uh, work in apply, uh, mathematics applied to molecular evolution and uh, simulations applied to, to biology. And uh, he has other interests in uh, biology education, which is very interesting. And he, 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 he has a, a chair in, in the ISH, at the International Society for the History of Bio um, Philosophy and Social Studies of Biology. And he also uh, studies history and philosophy of biology and interdisciplinary education and biology education. So now maybe we need a... Thank you very much for this invitation. It's a delight to be here in such an interdisciplinary audience. Um, and it's a delight to be here particularly at uh, the Gelbenkin because um, a lot of my work is the intersection of art and science and it's wonderful to be at such a place. So six years ago I was here in Portugal presenting at a different museum where they also celebrate uh, art and science up in Porto and I encourage you if you enjoy the Gelbenkin to also visit the Seralves. And I, I'm pleased that work here goes on in terms of both science and the art and I thought I'd start with a historian of artists, of art. At first it seems that nothing could be easier than seeing. We just point our eyes where we want to go and gather in what there is to see. Nothing could be less in need of explanation. The world is flooded with light and seeing is, every, is available to be seen. We can see people, pictures, landscapes, and everything else that we need to see. And with the help of science, we can see galaxies and viruses in the insides of our own body. Seeing does not interfere with the world or take anything from it, and it does not hurt or damage anything. Seeing is detached and efficient and rational. Unlike the stomach or the heart, eyes are our own to command. They obey every desire and thought. I thought it was important you mentioned landscape, because I want to talk today about landscapes and more so spaces. Each of those ideas is completely wrong. The truth is more difficult Seeing is irrational, inconsistent, and undependable. It's immensely troubled, cousin to blindness and sexuality, caught up in the threads of the unconscious. Our eyes are not ours to command. They roam where they will, and then they tell us they have only been where we have seen them, we have sent them. No matter how hard we look, we have very little of what we look at. We see very little of what we look at. If we imagine the eyes as navigational devices, we do so in order not to come to terms with what seeing really is. Seeing is like hunting and like dreaming and even like falling in love. It's entangled in the passions, jealousy, violence, possessiveness, and is soaked in affect, in pleasure and displeasure and in pain. Ultimately, seeing alters the thing that is seen and transforms the seer. Seeing is metamorphosis, not mechanism. Um, I'm very much influenced by one of Michael's colleagues, Dolph Seilocker. And he says, I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it. It's embarrassing to be a theoretician in front of many of you after seeing so much wonderful empirical model, but I was delighted that Michael emphasized that we as mathematical modelers do contribute something to these kind of fields. And it's uh, difficult sometimes going the second day because you've already seen uh, Alex Masudi uh, showed us adaptive landscapes of fitness versus the height and width of arrowheads. Damian Ortiz Rodriguez uh, showed us morpho spaces and state spaces. And um, some of the other kinds of things, Quentin Atkinson with splits trees and Mark Haber with coalescence, David Vecchi with the slot machine metaphor, and Michael not only had uh, dinosaur PCA morpho spaces. I have the same slide in my collection today, unfortunately, <laughs> or fortunately. But he also talked about the ornstein uhlen beck model for attractor and uh, optimization. So um, 
I hope I simply will convince you that mathematics is a lens that helps us to see, and it helps us particularly look at what is hidden in plain view, and that every image uh, offers an opportunity for us to test hypotheses and to infer something about causal mechanisms. And um, I'm particularly uh, influenced by that we would explore some of these uh, morphospaces and adaptive landscapes, uh, bioorthogonal transformations, and um, I decided I won't deal with nullimers in uh, terms of looking at so many things. But I'm very much taking a, a note from our leader here, uh, Professor Natalie Gondier, who uh, wrote a wonderful paper recently reviewing the history of uh, phylogenetic trees and asked the question of why have such tree iconography been so important and so widely used within the kind of uh, biological research domain. Uh, uh, she was somewhat anticipated by Michael Brady, who spoke yesterday, 1993, a wonderful paper he gave at Brandeis on uh, trees as tropes, uh, greatly influenced me in my career. So that I also want to insert that Donna Haraway says you have to love something deeply to be able to critique it well. And so I want you to appreciate um, that some of these models that have been persistent, uh, why are they beautiful and powerful? And how is their diversity kind of informed what we do before finishing with a strong critique? Because I do love them, but of course, every modeler knows that every model we build is false. We know that before we even begin it. We had to make all kinds of simplifications. But I love a paper by the philosopher Bill Wimsatt who said, false models to build locally truer theories. That we have simple models that are extraordinarily robust. So one of the earliest forms was actually in 1896. Carl Pearson's had a n-dimensional space in terms of with his law of ancestral heredity. But the one that most people know early on is Darcy Wentworth Thompson in his book on growth and form. And many people have kind of called him one of the first kind of uh, biomathematicians and very much celebrated. And uh, almost anybody who looks at morphology has some kind of sense of it. Uh, we unfortunately, uh, like Darwin, only think of him as the old man rather than the somewhat younger version uh, walking along the, the rocks in um, the cliffs uh, of uh, St. Andrews and uh, Dundee in Scotland. And uh, so here's the kind of thing that the uh, transformation of one species morphology to another was this kind of rubberized graph paper that Darcy Thompson kind of invoked with doing these kinds of images. And uh, particularly somewhat disturbing was the, for many people to uh, look at our relationships to other um, uh, anthropoid apes. Um, but uh, he did not only deal with uh, hard skeletons, he also dealt with uh, invertebrates and with plants. And uh, that in terms of looking at uh, his work, that it came out in 1917, uh, but it was actually when the reprinting in 1948 and uh, further development that had a major impact and uh, was uh, kind of picked up that uh, he was a uh, classical uh, scholar and in many cases a non-Darwinian. And uh, somehow that in the post-neo-Darwinian uh, synthesis, people picked him up in a very different kind of cast. And John Casty, in a wonderful article in Complexity said, what if De Arce had had a computer? And two colleagues at uh, St. Andrews University actually developed a quadratic kind of transformation. And so recently what we've done is build a similar kind of thing in a spreadsheet kind of environment where anybody could take any kind of image, um, simply get the XY coordinates, and then use a variety of uh, known mathematical functions to do this kind of thing. So we built DARC's morpher, and we instituted linear quadratic and um, matrix multiplication kinds of methods. And so what this allows us to do is to think about uh, how we can affect the scale, uh, the shear, the rotation, the reflection, the, et cetera, in terms of doing these kinds of things. And so uh, just giving you some kind of sense of 
the kind of mathematics that we're doing. Well, in a recent PNAS article, uh, they were actually looking at what was the relationship in the Galapagos finches in terms of doing this kind of thing. Uh, unfortunately, they used uh, just a, a fairly standard uh, particular kind of uh, scale and sh shear without uh, some uh, other, uh, i being picky here, I'll go on. Um, so we took some of the images, and take and localize on the beak, get the uh, data points, and then just looked at the kind of linear, affine, and quadratic kinds of transformations that one could do on these kinds of, of things. Now, this relates to Wright's adaptive landscapes in terms of that going from one beak shape to another is not necessarily traversing a huge valley. It might be simply going on a uh, multi-dimensional landscape, such as these kind of three-dimensional ones, of simply uh, bumping up the hill rather than going down a deep valley and back up. But in the finches, um, if you look at the Grant's work on the Galapagos, very frequently they might look simply at a two-dimensional version with three genotypes and looking at the relative fitnesses in terms of this. This is also another adaptive landscape. It's just we're used to thinking about the three-dimensional ones. Um, and so again, we instituted this kind of thing in software in terms of doing that sort of thing. But um, So one of the fun things, Richard Dawkins and his wife Lala Ward, uh, an artist, actually took a set of vertebrate skulls and do this kind of morphing kind of thing that I frequently find, many students find somewhat disconcerting to do uh, this kind of transformation. I'm hoping the microphone will pick this Surface up. Surface scans of five crania, males of each species, are shown at the leaves of the tree. Crania and internal nodes are generated using our morphing method. The parameters controlling the interpolated shape are computed using the squared change parsimony method. Once we have computed surfaces across the entire tree, we can run the evolutionary movie, so to speak, and watch how cranial shapes may have evolved from the common ancestor to the modern forms. Our estimated shape is a three-dimensional object which can be compared to fossils and modern crania. So one of the beauties of this method is uh, reconstructing the past, but it also has a very great clinical significance. Uh, this is just showing uh, how dysmorphologists and plastic surgeons uh, can use it both to plan your surgery and to think about uh, how you might go about it. And there's a whole field called morphometrics that uses landmarks. Uh, Fred Bookstein is one of the primary people in this area. But uh, people, uh, frequently students think, oh, okay, we're looking at fossils, but here's a contemporary significance in their lives. Um, so uh, Fred, in summarizing, this in Bulletin of Mathematical Biology called it the morphometric synthesis. At the core of contemporary morphometrics, the quantitative study of biological shape variation, it is a synthesis of two originally divergent methodological styles. Uh, one, the linear geometry of covariance structures. Secondly, the direct visualization of changes in biological form. To combine these two variants of biomathematical modeling, into a valid praxis for quantitative studies of biological shape was a goal earnestly sought through most of this century. And I'd say is now quite complete. Uh, here's a recent book, uh, Phylogenetic Analysis of Morphological Data, that uh, is very nicely done in terms of this kind of work. But it also intersects with the arts. Um, one of my favorite journals is an MIT journal called Leonardo that combines the arts and sciences. And recently I went to Cambridge and. England to the museum where they had this wonderful exhibit kind of looking at building chimeras as sculptures in terms of combining art and science. Let's look at a second case, the famous case of David Raup and the kind of morphospace of uh, gastropods and cephalopods and, and uh, bivalves, brachiopods. Um, what's unfortunate, I want to argue, is too often people simply look at it as the um, final conclusion and not understanding 
in terms of what was built up. David was working on an analog computer, and uh, when he first showed it to me, um, what he actually was using was the afterglow on a cathode ray tube that the persistence of the glow would give you a three-dimensional kind of effect of a structure. And uh, it, it wasn't until a really good 3D computer graphics that we could kind of reproduce what he was doing on these very simple machines of very low memory at that time. Um, so we're dealing with objects that have been objects of art and collections all over the world and so on, and the wonderful kind of diversity, uh, many kinds of characters that are coded on them, uh, poetry written about them and so on. But, you know, what makes it shell and what are the kind of things we pick up on? Uh, Self-similarity, helical spiral, the aperture, the plane of the aperture, the surface ornamentation, and the color patterns. Um, wonderful book that I encourage you to look at called The Algorithmic Beauty of Seashells that deals uh, excellently with color patterns. So we built various kind of models, so, so looking at four parameters. Uh, world extension rate, the distance for the world from the axis, the world shape, the translation rate. And uh, here's just how you make those kind of measurements. And then building them with different parameters. And I'll just rapidly go through a slew of examples just to see how these match various kinds of different shells. When you go from four parameters to 16 parameters, so we could produce quite a bit of diversity, and uh, that we then gone on in terms of doing uh, with my colleague Joe Ellis Monahan at St. Michael's College. Um, some even greater, but I want to stop for a moment. It was very interesting that Edgar Allan Poe was hired as kind of a writer's hack in the 19th century, and Sean Rice at Yale pointed out that he was the first one with kind of not knowing better to unite malacology, the study of the live organisms, with conchology, the study of the shells. And uh, so Sean has built models in terms of how is the growing lip of the shell uh, in terms of the live organism laying it down actually occurring and how might we model these better than simple kind of mathematical top-down kind of models. But there's also models that are built in terms of finite difference equations and uh, various kinds of things that you can find uh, online that take different kinds of uh, parameters in terms of what they're looking at and so on and producing those. So Raup came up with this morphospace that, uh, of these different kinds of forms that when we then plotted them onto extant and extinct forms that we found these four major classes of life. And uh, Richard Dawkins celebrated it as the museum of all shells in his Climbing Mount Improbable. Um, so more recently, uh, the Mathematics Association of America became uh, quite interested in this uh, in terms of illustrating it artistically, and uh, my close collaborator, Joe Ellis Monahan, uh, and her colleagues uh, developed it. It's uh, in an undergraduate mathematics applications journal I call UMAP in terms of looking at it and the code and so on. And so basically, um, in terms of uh, this kind of uh, model is it takes a frame of reference called a frame, and uh, then it builds this in terms of the three vectors that are involved, and you're sweeping out a curve in space in terms of doing this, and uh, you parameterize your model, and then looking at varying various ratios of these things, and you get some quite beautiful forms. The sculptor uh, George Hart um, has been doing 3D printing of these things, and he says he has the first truly logarithmic spiral that ever existed because none ever existed in nature. And, and you can begin to see, uh, you know, things that are more scallop-like and so on in terms of how we vary these kind of parameters and do these kind of things. Adding more effects, we can do ridges and ripples and so on, 
Um, but uh, one of the things is uh, it allows us, in terms of looking at that, to not only look at the spectrum of possible morphologies and the relationship between different species, but to reconstruct uh, partial fra uh, fossils from fragments and other kinds of things. Uh, it also informs us on how to measure in terms of our specimens, and so uh, there's been a standardization in terms of much of this kind of effort. And uh, so we can see a close parallel between actual shells and re recreated shells. Uh, and so it provides a nice early entry into mathematical modeling, and uh, it also provides openings for people to extend it with uh, other kinds of surface features and irregularities and so on. And uh, one of the things is that in looking at some of these kind of patterns, uh, we interact with other uh, reaction diffusion uh, kinds of models, and you'll probably hear more about that in some papers here at the meeting. Uh, but uh, also in terms of finding certain fossil specimens and certain live specimens in 2009, uh, there was a wonderful thing of the top 10 new species and one of the wonderful uh, organisms was a snail that violated almost all of these kind of structures. And so uh, we also have a way of what, what are the hopeful monsters? What are, what are the things that kind of violate our models in terms of doing these things? Um, and modeling other kinds of aspects uh, as well in terms of the structures and, and so on uh, of these things. So there are many other uh, morphospaces. Uh, one of the most well worked out is that the foraminifera uh, have a very similar kind of morphospace. Uh, you're not too surprised and uh, already Professor Benton uh, talked about this nice paper in terms of radiation with dinosaurs and a principal components uh, model of looking at it. Uh, there's been uh, catfish and other kinds of things of looking at these. So secondly, I want to take you um, from the animal world to the plant world. And so if we look at trees, and uh, very unfortunately, it's usually hard to get people to look at winter trees without their leaves, but uh, actually naked trees are, are very nice for getting us to look at uh, what is the phytoarchitecture of various kind of specimens and appealing to obviously photographic artists as well. So Mandelbrot said, clouds are not spheres, mountains are not cones, coastlines are not circles, bark is not smooth, nor does lightning travel in a straight line. I was in Brussels and took this photograph and uh, you know, who knows? With topiary, obviously, we have trees that are cones, spheres, and cubes. Uh, Aristid Lindemeyer, uh, a Dutch uh, mathematical biologist, introduced a graph grammar system. It's a graph rewriting system called an L system. Uh, this is a very simple model where you can see a Fibonacci series, one, one, two, three, five, eight, in terms of a simple kind of uh, reproduction rule. And uh, some of you may looked at uh, uh, children's graphics, you know, go a step, turn left, etc. Or, you know, how does a young child have a sense of differential geometry? It's not x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared for a circle, but walk a little, turn a little, walk a little, turn a little. And so these kind of graphics uh, appeal greatly. Carl Nicholas has been the pioneer in terms of looking at plant biomechanics and the evolution of the physical forms of plants and has very much looked at things like Murray's Law or uh, da Vinci's law in terms of the kind of flow through a plant, the kind of mechanical support, uh, the light interception, and obviously reproduction. And so he's uh, looked at what might be some uh, ideal plant morphologies. He's looked at some of the early fossil record of what are some of the earliest branching trees and kind of produced what he thought would be a theoretical morphospace of plants in terms of uh, looking at these different kind of parameters that plants might be trying to do problem solving in their environment. And so looking at the relative lengths of two separate uh, sub-branches uh, between nodes, the angle between branches, 
the angle of phyllotaxis. In other words, how many steps did you have to go up before there's another branch coming out at the same angle as the branch that you're on. And so we built a piece of software called 3D Fractal Tree in which uh, you could go out and measure, put it into a spreadsheet, put in your Lindenmeyer uh, graph grammar, and then build a tree. And so this was um, my colleagues in Thailand, uh, Nopadan Kirapet in his lab, and this was a small tree outside of our lab that we tried to model. And here was another tree outside of our lab, and uh, they enjoyed actually putting it into a landscape kind of environment and so on. But it picks up on the notion of self-similarity, what you try to get people to do these kind of models is how when you go out, how can you look at one small twig from a tree and that it represents the whole form of the tree. And generally it takes people about five times to uh, get something that's fairly representative. And um, in the algorithmic beauty of plants, an alternative to the algorithmic beauty of uh, seashells, uh, Prusenkevich uh, in uh, Canada has built just gorgeous kind of models of these things. And we can even think of the rules as being strings just like DNA, and we can do recombination and mutation and look at a variety of different things considering uh, different kinds of rules and plant structures and so on. So we're to, able to evolve them and select upon them and so on in terms of doing this. And so plants with branching patterns that gather the most light, some cases will be more successful. If you're in a high light environment, you're actually shading may be important. Uh, that uh, you producing a great deal of uh, storage, but at the same time, you have to deal with mechanical things of the stresses and strains of wind and rain and other kinds of things and so on. And so in terms of looking at these models, they've helped us explore in terms of doing this kind of thing. And so we were able to build our own uh, kind of morphospace using our software. And this was an article on morphospace. We did it uh, two years ago in math modeling and natural phenomena. Let's go to the bacterial world. Unfortunately, most of you probably have experience of growing bacteria in the lab, frequently on high nutrient environments that are nice, soft, and warm, you know, probably good models for what's occurring in your mouth or your gut or something like that. But uh, many organisms, and the interest in extremophiles in particular, live in very harsh environments, low food and hard substrates. If you grow bacteria in these kind of conditions, uh, that uh, you get these fractal-like structures. And Scientific American article called it the artistry of microorganisms. And uh, last year, I published a paper on mathematics makes microbes beautiful, beneficial, and bountiful in advances in applied microbiology. And our book called Microbes Count, we introduced people to use the notion of fractal geometry, just as the famous case of measuring the coast of England, the shorter the ruler, the longer the coast gets in terms of measuring it. Do you fly over it, drive over it, ride your bicycle, go hiking, or do you take a micrometer over every grain of sand? Is that the uh, thing will. And so new kinds of dimensions, such as Hausdorff mentions, uh, or Lesequeux mentions, et cetera, uh, are used in terms of looking at these kind of methods. And so we uh, frequently have people uh, take your image, do image analysis on it, and do these log-log plots. But here's the morphospace of bacteria, is the kind of round, smooth colonies are a, one part of the morphospace of bacteria of high nutrients and soft auger. And these uh, diffusion-limited aggregation-type fractal structures occur at hard, uh, medium, and uh, low nutrients kind of thing. Um, Another example where we've built a huge database of all of the uh, kind of data that we could find on the Galapagos finches. We literally had to go to multiple museums and uh, collect uh, uh, from old notebooks and s photographs of specimens and so on. Um, and so we built this uh, Beagle investigation returns with Darwinian data. And we have bird songs, morphology data, molecular data, georeference maps, and so on. And so my students, for instance, here just did body length, wing length, and uh, uh, beak length, and uh, got a three-dimensional morphospace in which you could individually uh, recognize uh, clouds with 13 Galapagos finch species. 
In a recent article on PCA plots in science in 2012, that this phenotypic space, they began looking at these clouds in terms of the kind of beak archetyped and the kind of diet, and you would see this kind of amorphous space. And one of the things I want to emphasize is that underlying this, so you're in a high dimensional space, you've taken a plane through that to find what are the kind of discrete clouds that represent these species, but underlying it is a phylogenetic tree that they are also sub-connected to one another, and so we need to think of them that way. Well, let's shift to a, a, a case of another kind of adaptive landscape. So the classic case that we talk about for balanced polymorphism in evolution is sickle cell anemia, that hemoglobin A, hemoglobin A is susceptible to malaria, hemoglobin S, hemoglobin S to sickle cell anemia, but the hemoglobin A, hemoglobin S heterozygote is resistant to both malaria and sickle cell anemia. But there's a third allele, and that's hemoglobin C that has occurred in low frequency, and uh, that in building these two adaptive landscapes, that uh, one can see, oh, I forgot to bring up my thing, but right here at this point, this is the hemoglobin A, hemoglobin S uh, polymorphism that's stable. So if you're in this environment, you're sucked into here, and so you would see that at this lower peak here, versus the hemoglobin C, hemoglobin C, you have a homozygote that is at the highest peak of fitness, that in this case, um, would be uh, where the population would do. Well, in those tribes that have a high amount of uh, hemoglobin C, it actually is they reduce the taboo against incest, and there's closer inbreeding. And uh, that this is one of the ways to cross this valley between this lower peak of balanced polymorphism and try to get to this higher fitness feet. But it's very important because for people to understand that it is not survival of the fittest. As soon as you go to three alleles model or you go to two loci, two alleles, that that kind of aphorism breaks down. So what are the strengths of these kind of models? They continuously guide empirical research. They provide tools for testing hypotheses. They explain complex interactions between multiple evolutionary factors. They train biological intuition identify crucial parameters and factors, evaluate relevant temporal and spatial scales, point to gaps in biological knowledge, and provide simple and intuitive tools and metaphors for thinking about complex phenomena. This is Sergei Gravelets uh, at the National Institute for Mathematical Biosciences Synthesis Center in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, but um, they also violate, uh, obey what I kind of look for in a mathematical model applied to biology. They account for phylogenetic diversity. They apply across broad temporal and spatial scales, and they frequently are the function of multiple causal mechanisms. And I think that's kind of crucial. There have been a couple of philosophical papers who have addressed uh, morpho uh, spaces and adaptive landscapes. Uh, so Gunther Ebb uh, says, given the dominance of adaptational thinking in evolutionary biology, exclusive focus on function often masks a plethora of evolutionary relevant questions such as heterochrony, heterotopy, uh, asymmetry of the amount of variation in developmental time, and links between phylogenetic and ontogenetic trends. Um, Mitrocker and Hudiger, and I know somebody is here from the Conrad Lorenz Institute, said that morphological spaces, morphospaces, are spaces describing and relating organismal phenotypes. They play a central role in morphometrics, the statistical description of biological forms, but also underlie the notion of adaptive landscapes that drives many theoretical considerations in evolutionary biology. The typical language of theoretical uh, and evolutionary biology comprising statements about the distance amongst phenotypes in an according space about, about different directions of evolution is not warranted for all types of morphospace. I want to pick up on both of those things. 
McGee, probably the primary apologist for morphospaces and adaptive landscapes uh, in his geometry of evolution, has been critiqued by Curie in terms of looking at it, and particularly raising some of the critiques with arguments from convergence. So I would like to end with kind of my own list uh, of the challenges. On the left are primarily uh, ones that uh, come from uh, Sober and Morris um, and uh, uh, from Gavrilets. Uh, Sober says we need to always distinguish between selection of and selection for, that uh, many times these representations are impoverished because the summary involves the loss of information the components cannot be recovered from the net model. Uh, convergence as a physical force that we see th same things, for instance, in a virus and maybe, say, a radiolarian, or that we see in a foraminifera or in uh, a mollus. Uh, horizontal gene transfer, endosymbiosis, and uh, other kind of symbiotic events uh, allow some people would argue, allow organisms to jump between fitness peaks or to completely re-sculpt the landscape. And evolutionary hitchhiking of neutral or slightly adaptive traits may very much uh, deform what we usually think of as an adaptive landscape. And from computer science, that it may not be monotonic hill climbing, but satisficing where we're both sacrificing and satisfying at the same time. On the right, my own particular kinds of critiques is that they rely overly on a Euclidean two- and three-dimensional intuitive geometry. The kind of distances that are frequently uh, depauperate in terms of they might uh, use other kinds of dimensions, such as already mentioned Hausdorff dimensions and other kinds of things that uh, vary in different kinds of ways. That in multi-dimensional morphospaces, that the, our typical intuition about valleys may not really apply. There might be tunnels uh, or intersecting clouds or archipelagos of islands or very high dimensional kind of networks. Um, the notions of continuity may be false and particularly Sergei, Sergei Gavrilets, I'll show in the next slide, has talked about holy kind of landscapes. But we also frequently we're dealing with organisms that are fractal in form and we need to think about that. But with combinatory explosions, it's impossible to explore all space in finite evolutionary time. Uh, we have some exceptions that we treasure. And these models frequently fail to distinguish between the possible, the probable, and the plausible. So here's a notion of a holy kind of landscape of Sergei Gavrilets and uh, thinking very differently about some of these kind of morphospaces. Conclude with a quote by Aaron Kasir Kocholsky, who said, biologists can be divided into two classes, experimentalists who observe things that cannot be explained, and theoreticians who explain things that cannot be observed. Most of my career has been practicing biological aftermath. People seek you out when the paper gets rejected, something's not working, or they want to figure out a better way to measure something. So thank you very much, and I'd like to thank my funders as well. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.